I know you're more awake than that. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to South Valley Unitarian Universal Society. My name is Reverend Carrie McDrone, and I am the interim minister here this year. My pronouns are she and hers. Our service this morning is about living in the present while we are also waiting for the expectation of the future. Today is the beginning of the Advent season, the season of waiting. It is also the day that the Ministerial Search Committee is finishing its congregational record, and in a few days it's going to be ready for future ministers to see. So this is a very big day here at this congregation. We'd like to point out that this next Saturday is the Beyond Categorical Thinking Workshop. If you have not signed up for that, please go to the, our website that has a link and you can follow the link for that. This is a very exciting time in the life of this congregation where we have finished many, many things and now things have been created and are being put out into the world and who knows what is going to happen. This is a very exciting time to be here. Let us begin our worship service this morning by singing 10,008 in your teal hymnal when our heart is in a holy place.
Please join together in saying our chalice like words and order of service. We bind our chalice for the warmth of love, for the light of truth, and for the energy of our action. You may be seated. Good morning. My name is Deborah Dean. I'm today's worship leader. I would like to welcome you this morning to South Valley Unitarian Universalist Society. We are an intentionally diverse religious community. All are welcome here. We would like to extend an especially warm welcome to those of you who are visiting for the first time. We're so glad you're here. We want to get to know you better. This is a caring, supportive community. In the chapel of the back of the sanctuary, there is a book to write down your joys and concerns. Feel free to share a joy or concern there. A member of our carrying committee can follow up with you then, and we'll do something with that. Children are also always welcome in the sanctuary during the service. If you'd like to have us take care of your little ones during the service, we have a nursery downstairs. We also broadcast this service on closed circuit TV, so you can watch it down there in the social hall and in the nursery too. After the service, everyone is invited downstairs for fellowship and to check out the happenings hub, where you can learn about all the things that we do in this South Valley community. In addition, in the order of service, there are announcements on the back page where you can learn about ways to participate in the life of this community. And as we begin, I ask that you please place your electronic devices in worship mode. We encourage you to take pictures, post them on Facebook if you want or tweet, but do so quietly. Thank you. Now please turn and greet your neighbor and welcome them into worship. Brought them in a big brown hole to Mrs. Bishop's porch. 
that sneaky kid she did. This made Mrs. Bishop very, very happy. So she baked a big batch of blueberry muffins and thought of five people who might have brought those beautiful berries and then secretly gave each of them a point. How great! Five people got a point. One of those five was her paper boy, Billy Parker. And when Billy saw his name on a note in the driveway on a plate, he quickly parked his bike and ate every crumb. This made him so glad that the next five people got their papers on their porch and not in bushes. <laughs> in fact, they were handed right to them. One of those five was Mr. Stevens, who was so amazed that he smiled for 10 hours on the airplane. And then he said to five different people who had heavy bags, here, let me help you. He still smiled and they did too. One of those five was Maria, whose cranky little boy James stopped crying when Mr. Stevens played the peek the game with him until they arrived right game. When he waved goodbye, Maria explained how strange that a stranger would be so sweet. And the next day, when she was out shopping, once, twice, five times, she did something nice for five different people, five times without stopping. One of those five was Joseph, old and bent and gray, in front of her at the produce stand. When he said, I guess I counted wrong, I don't really need these oranges, little James reached out to him, with an orange from their basket. And Maria put a coin in Joseph's hand and said, here, take this, the oranges are on us. As Joseph shuffled to the bus, his eyes were full and his eyes were wet and his hands did helpful things for the next five people he met. One of those five was Sarah, a college girl who was off to see the world and stopped at Joseph's shop. When her back broke and her face fell all over the floor, she said, oh, what will I do? Joseph said, this is for you and he gave her a new map woven with his own hands in red and purple and green. Oh, thank you, she said. This is the loveliest bag I've ever seen. When Sarah left, she left and felt sunny as new, and she just had to shine on five people. One of those five was Sophia, whom she met on a boat, looking like the world might end, looking like someone without a friend. What beautiful blue eyes you have, Sarah said and they're just the color of the flowers in your lovely dress. Yes, said Sophia. Yes, said Sarah. The beautiful blue eyes shed a happy tear, and when the boat trip was through, Sophia called five people to make them feel happy too. One of those five was Tom, her son the doctor, who was having a very hard day. Hi, she said. I love you, Tom. Well, how great to hear your voice, he sighed. I always need my mom. Dr. Tom was so cheered that on his next break, he bought a bunch of bright balloons for five young patients, and he handed them out right then and there. One of those five was Peter, a little boy who went home from the hospital that every day. Gratitude for the big bunch of bright balloons filled him and thrilled him and spilled out of him onto the next five people who came his way. One of those five was Eric, a teenage boy whose sacks and such were way too much. One, when one dropped on the sidewalk, Peter stopped his play and rushed right over, saying super wheels to the rescue. Well, Eric, no longer stressed, was very impressed, and he made a mental note that that very afternoon, he would help five people. One of those five was Dee, his ten-year-old sister, who didn't have many friends and was painfully shy. When Eric said, hey sis, you want to come to the park and learn how to ride my skateboard? She looked at him wide-eyed. Serious? She cried. Sure, he said. And because of her brother, Dee decided that maybe she could be a friend to five others. One of those five was Louise, a homeless woman who lived under the trees. She could hardly believe her ears when she heard Dee say, My brother and I would like to buy you a hot dog and a drink out that sand over there. Could it be true? Someone actually cared? Cared enough to give her a ring and a smile? Give her food and a smiley face ring that was practically new. Louise was so pleased that she decided that even though she had nothing, she would find five others and give them something. One of those five was Mr. Taylor, who lost his wallet in the park. Louise found it full of fives and tens and twenties. Oh, what she could do with all that money. But she found his name and called his home and over he came. He was so impressed that she was honest in spite of being poor that he offered her a job in his story and he vowed to be something generous for five people or more. One of those five was Kate, a woman on vacation who wanted to see a show she heard was a sensation. Oh no, 
home, she said, it's sold out, but I'm going home tomorrow. And her face filled with sorrow. Mr. Taylor held out his ticket. I live here, he said. I can go any time. Take mine. Kate loved the show and was so touched that she thought of buying five presents for five people back home. And one of those five presents was a little hard necklace for Mary, her niece. And you should have seen her eyes light up in surprise. Mary, ordinary Mary? Yes, ordinary Mary's extraordinary teeth had come full circle. And on its way, she <coughs> had to realize that every person would be. You see, when Mrs. Bishop made muffins for Mary's blueberries, not only did the paper boy Billy Parker, but the other four people too, made five people smile. And after a while, in only 15 days, love was sent to every person everywhere. Let's just see how it went. Start with one, and with over six billion. Well, six billion is even more than all the people on the planet. So after everyone had a share and everybody knew that someone cared, there was even love left over. The world was changed, and thousands and millions and billions agreed that it was all because one ordinary day, ordinary Mary did a perfectly ordinary, stunningly earth-shaking, totally extraordinary deed. for just a little bit longer than we normally do. To prepare, I encourage you to get in whatever position feels comfortable for you physically. Put your feet on the floor or shift. Notice the tension that you're holding in your shoulders. And just bring your whole physical self, your energy here into this space. Let us hold a moment of silence here together. Spirit of life, O Holy One, on this first day of December, as this congregation moves into a new time of waiting, we ask that you be with us in the space of in between. We are reminded of times in our lives when we waited with uncertainty and trepidation, and other times with excitement for new beginnings. Perhaps we, as individuals, are also waiting now for something to shift in our own lives. Whatever we are waiting for, let us be at peace. During this time of in-between, where anything is possible, may we practice patience with each other in all of our interactions. Let us remember that here in this community and how we practice our values in our larger world, we are creating the beloved community we wish to see and experience. Wherever possible, may we each practice kindness and inclusiveness. In this time of change, in this time of waiting, help us remember who we are on a cellular level, and may we live 
into this awareness. May it be so. South Valley story this morning, but unfortunately she could not be here. She will give her story at another time. In the spirit of serving our wider community, we at South Valley split our Sunday morning offering with a charitable organization that aligns with our values and principles. For November and December, we have chosen Candy Cane Corner, a special holiday store that provides an empowering experience and an empowering holiday shopping experience for people and families experiencing homelessness in our community. Family members and individuals visit the store with their case manager and select beautiful new gifts for their children and loved ones. Candy King Corner is sponsored in partnership between the Road Home and Volunteers of America, Utah. I want to just make sure I don't think this is working now. We're always going in the in-between. So I want to draw your attention that these are some of the gifts that we have been collecting over the past month or so that are going to the Candy Cane Corner. And uh, uh, so there's a box in the foyer that has more of these that we've been collecting. So I brought them up to the altar today to bring attention to this and to say thank you to those who have contributed and that to bless these gifts for the people that, who are going to be purchasing them from Kennedy Cane Corner and then passing them on as gifts to the people of their families. May these gifts bring them happiness and joy and being connected to, to their communities. I appreciate all of you who made these contributions to happen. Will you join me in saying the words printed in the order of our service for our offering. We are this church. We are its hands, its heart, its voice. Together we share the love of this community and sustain it with our gifts. <laughs>
I started a new practice here a couple weeks ago of blessing our offer. Love through all of us blesses and multiplies all that we have, all that we give, and all that we receive. May these gifts be a blessing to South Valley and to Kennedy Park. I began thinking about this worship service um, uh, maybe a couple months ago when uh, we were thinking hard about that today is December 1st. And what is it again? Today is the day that the congregational record is complete. I see Bob here. I'm wondering if <laughs> this is a, a very important time in the life of our community because this is about bringing all of the work that has been happening here together into one place. For those of you who are new here, who are visiting, this congregation is in its second year of having an interim minister and is working towards having a sub minister to begin next fall. And there is a very long process that has to happen. A lot of work goes into this. And so there's been a group called the Ministerial Search Committee and they have been working hard. They've done surveys and uh, cottage meetings, trying to take everything that they've learned from all of you to be able to articulate that to a future self-minister. <coughs> I brought the, um, the poster board in here so you could all see what I was referring to. This poster board breaks down the process of each part along the way so that you are aware and included and uh, aware of how each part of this goes. But I couldn't help but notice that December 1st is also the beginning of Advent. And whether the UA, the Unitarian Universalist Association, meant that to be the way it is or not, but that's how it's worked out. So I tend to look for what are the stories behind this and how, what are the lessons we can learn in this season. Because right now, this once this congregational record is uploaded, we are in the season of waiting that there is nothing more to do at this time. There's a lot of work put into creating it, and putting it out to the universe, and then waiting to see what is the response. And so the season of Advent is very similar to that, in that we are waiting. This Advent season is the one where Christians are waiting for Jesus to be born. There's a long, steady buildup towards Christmas. I grew up attending a Baptist church that tried to do nothing at all in any way, anything, anything at all that smacked of Catholicism. And so I learned very, very little about religious practices outside of the independent Baptist world. 
I didn't know that about things like the service called Bondi Thursday. I didn't know about Ash Wednesday. I didn't know about a lot of things that for many people are very ordinary. But in the world I grew up in, that was like not going to happen in any way. And it, it took a lot for me to finally learn what that was and to have the humility to see that there is um, there are things in those practices that we can all learn whether we uh, practice that particular religion or not. In the Protestant world I grew up in, there was very little, the, the practices were very, they were very few. And it, so it was only prayer, it was only reading the Bible. And it, so if only because of going to a very interfaith seminary in New York City that I learned a lot more about different types of faiths and uh, saw where my own prejudices were about other faiths, and then I began to be open to seeing that there are ways that we can learn from each other, that we don't have to throw everything out just because we don't have those particular beliefs. We can still learn from some practices. And so what I appreciate about the season of Advent is that it is a deliberate waiting. That many times, those of us, I'm sure if I did a poll in the room, many of you are waiting for something right now. There are lots of things that we are waiting for. So how do we actually practice knowing that we are waiting for this thing to happen? And <clears throat> I look at Advent as a spiritual practice way of being able to be open to that possibility. Something new is going to happen. Can I be in a space of waiting, being okay with waiting, and not trying to rush my time through this? I'm grateful that I had that time <clears throat> to learn more about Advent. I still don't know very much of their particulars. I feel like in many ways I got kind of an overview of a lot of things, but not in, in depth like I probably would hope to in the future. But what I have learned is about being able to sit in the not knowing. In the Advent, there is the awareness that the hope is, of course, that we're with Jesus' birth. But here, we are in the practice of not knowing. The congregational record is going to be uploaded, and we have no idea what's going to happen after that. It's kind of, in a way, it's kind of both scary and exciting. How do we have the practice of sitting and waiting through this time together? So I wanted to particularly tie it to Advent because it helps us to really be grounded in how do we just not, not try to force things, not try to rush things, not try to make things better by doing something else, by keeping ourselves busy in other ways. But how do we stay here, not making it move faster? I believe that the liberal religious world and its insistence of not being too identified with Christianity, fundamentalist Christianity in particular, has somehow overlooked the reality that all people, whether we believe in any particular religious belief, still need to have ways to live in a liminal space and in between. To me, that is what good religion is, is about remembering who we are, and that we are all humans who have particular needs, and that religion, a religious practice, a spiritual practice, helps us to be grounded through that. I notice when we've thrown out the practice of Advent, our larger culture has also moved from waiting and noticing, being quiet in the stillness, being quiet in the snow that I've really enjoyed here, and instead trying to speed everything up. We see it in the stores where Christmas decorations went up in October. The weekend of the auction, I went to Michael's with a friend and it, it was like being hit with all the Christmas stuff and I think that was first weekend in November. And uh, walking in Michael's with all the decorations and people piling up their cars. At first I thought it was a joke. Then <laughs> <laughs> my friend Jen and I were like, what's going on? <laughs> November, what, what's happening? And people had their cars like packed, and then I saw the signs that said that these decorations were 50% off. And I'm like, oh my gosh, people are like stocking up now, and I worry about what that does to our psyche. 
what that does to our emotions when we are trying to rush through all of these parts of our lives. And we have an outer culture that encourages us to do that. But it just keeps pushing the time forward instead of how can we stay here now? How can we not quite celebrate Christmas until at least we get through Thanksgiving? What is one thing that we can do to stay here in this day? I've noticed recently that the practice of Advent calendars has gotten a little more popular, and then even many of my liberal religious or liberal religious professional colleagues, I noticed this yesterday in my Facebook group I'm in, that they're sharing daily readings to support the practice of Advent. I want to encourage you to think about what are ways that you can do, perhaps even if you don't celebrate Christmas, you don't celebrate the birth of Jesus, what are other ways that you can build in time to, to slow down, to appreciate every day what is coming up for you in those moments and slowing down the practice. And even next Sunday, when Eddie Carroll with the Unitarian Universalist Association that they're going to preach on another advent of hope, uh, another theme of advent tied into the ministerial search process on hope. That these themes are resonant with who we are across all of our religious beliefs. I'm so glad that our culture is moving towards reclaiming religious practices. Not everything has to be thrown out just because we don't share the same specific religious beliefs. It makes me wonder, what about what are you preparing for in your life? Sometimes we consciously are thinking about those things, but many times to survive, we kind of put them on the back burner because it's just too hard to think about that all the time because it's just, it's just too much. You prepare and you have to let it go. But then you know that, that is, it's always this energy that's still present for you. And you think about what is happening in your life. This time at South Valley, here in this season of waiting, is also a time of wondering. I'm wondering about the ways that this time of in-between can be used to be centered on what we can learn from South Valley's history. <clears throat> How can we get prepared for your new settled minister, getting clear about your relationship with them, and continuing to build connections here. But that is work that continues to happen even during this time of in-between. One way that is showing up is in thinking about what the space looks like here. For example, when you go into a friend's home or even into your own home, just try to think about what is the space telling you. So I've had conversations with some folks about what does the space say about South Valley? What is the story you're trying to tell through what is here on the walls and in the spaces that we all share? There has been some discussion about the possibility of having a Founders Corner, a section of possibility for having a, a, a past ministers in a section together to say, this is part of our history, this is who we are. I think it's important to really highlight who we are and your, your accomplishments. You've had some really wonderful accomplishments, being able to really highlight those things and bring them out. In addition to the outer things that you can see, that there's a bylaws task force that's approved by the board right now that's working on some of those types of work that needs to be done, that there is an effort between the leadership council and the board to find policies that have been written sometimes even 10, 15 years ago that we are finding and we're trying to put them together. And this is a part of housekeeping and getting ready when you have a new guest, when you want to put your best face forward. You want to have these things and be clear about who these things are and how they represent you. The living, the work of living in the in-between has begun, but there is also the internal work. I think about the time of interim, this is my analogy that I give to people who ask me what in the heck interim work is and why in the world I want to do this anyway, is that I look at interim as is the space kind of the analogy is about a relationship, because it is a relationship. It's a relationship between this congregation and your future subtle minister. Whenever a relationship ends in your life, for whatever reason, before going into the next relationship, I think it's very important to take that time of in-between and to 
pay attention to how am I taking care of myself? Am I getting myself prepared for a new relationship? Am I clear about what I need and how I can put that into place? Those kinds of things I see is also part of the interim work. How do we get ready for this new person and how do we create the space of actual welcoming? The space in between that it allows for new possibilities, maybe something you hadn't imagined before. You never know what could happen, but you have to be prepared for possibilities and new things that you hadn't imagined. <clears throat> when you are in a liminal space, what you can do to acknowledge this, knowing you can't make the time go any faster, you can't make the months or days fly by, I was just talking with someone earlier today about how they were already tired of the snow and wanted that uh, they wanted the season to end soon and why can't we get to the end of March? And I said, life doesn't work that way. We can't speed time up. All we can do is be right here. And so if that is the case, what can we do to prepare ourselves, our hearts, our minds for this new change? <clears throat> There is still time between now and then the video interviews and then eventually a vote to be taken. There are still quite a few months <clears throat> in between. So how is this congregation going to be prepared for that? This is, right now, a wonderful time of creativity and experimentation of thinking, who are we? What do we want to actually be? How can we put that into place? We are our own people and own that. Think about who you are, settled from a different, different from the previous settled minister and who you would like to be. This is the time to be very clear that you, as members and friends, truly support this congregation through your financial gifts, your time, and your willingness to support and try new things. <clears throat> this is the time to claim who you are, which means supporting the work of this congregation when you're asked and showing up for the work that is in process now. <clears throat> I forgot to put the little stand on this side. If you are asked to step into a volunteer position, I encourage you to, instead of coming up with an immediate no, <laughs> because this happens a lot everywhere, Instead of having an immediate no, think about what could I do? Maybe there is a possibility here. How can you step into a new way of being here? The Ministerial Search Committee, as I said, has worked really hard to have a high percentage of responses from the surveys. They had many cottage meetings. <clears throat> and now they need you, once again, to show up this Saturday for the Beyond Categorical Thinking Workshop. <clears throat> This isn't something that other people somewhere else are supposed to do. This is your work. You are a part of the process. You are very much needed. Please make the time to come to this workshop. Your input is valuable. Now is not the time to back off your involvement at South Valley. Now is not the time for a wait and see attitude. It is the time to step into and fully claim your role here. South Valley UU Society is in a unique place geographically to make a contribution to liberal religion right here. Now is definitely the time to be curious about how South Valley can better live into its ideals and for you to think about how you can be a part of that. The work of the congregation belongs to everyone. You are needed here. All contributions matter. Living in a season of expectation requires both waiting and action, paying attention and being curious. <clears throat> it is not the time to sit back and wait for the new minister to come in and do things that you are dreaming of. This is your congregation own it completely. I would like to end with a quote that helped me through crisis in my life many years ago. I was feeling lost and confused and unsure about what was going to happen next in my life. A friend of mine sent me an email with this quote. 
And now it hangs in what, for many of us, is one of the most prominent places in our homes on my refrigerator, where all good quotes go. This quote is from Mornier Marie Roque. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard this before. Be patient towards all that is unsolved in your heart, and try to love the questions themselves, like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers which cannot be given you, because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. Like all you use, you are living in the space of having things unsolved in your heart. There is still healing to do from past ministries here. There are many unanswered questions about both the present and the future. But perhaps in this space of in-between, we can be okay with a few unanswered questions. <clears throat> knowing that one day you will live into the answers, <coughs> excuse me, whatever they may be. Please join us in singing number 112 in your great hymn. Extinguishing words together. We extinguish this chalice, but not. 